worry about a lesson behind the other students on Friday class anyway. But uh, we'll uh, look at uh, some of the vocabulary in this class, and then get onto the and then get onto the uh, the actual lecture and the note taking. You may have noticed by now that uh, the last two units, especially, uh, we don't really rely too much on. Um, giving you examples because um, you know the examples as I've said a couple of times before the examples are not really there to be memorized and um, they are just suggestions on how you may uh, take notes uh, in the future so it's not really um, there is limited value it's a, it's a useful guide but um, after a certain number of classes you should be able to get the uh, get the idea of um, at least the basics of note taking so that we we remove the vowels from a word. We can use acronyms and abbreviations and all of that stuff. So it shouldn't be uh, too difficult. What we're really going to be looking at in the uh, in this and the the next few classes is going to be grouping the ideas so that when you come back to review the notes, obviously the notes are no good if you don't review. When you come back to review the notes, then they actually make sense when you read them. So we've already seen. Uh, that it's necessary to uh, indent your notes. So going across the page from left to right and going down uh, left to right, left to right, so that we actually see um, a progression. And the way that we do this is that we, first of all, we start off with, um, first of all, we start off with um, the Roman numerals. Then we move on to, um, capital letters then we can move on to Arabic uh, numbers then we can go back again and we can use lowercase Roman numerals and then we can use uh, lowercase letters and each time we will we will uh, we will we, we will indent a little bit so then we go down and then we so and then we go down, then indent, and then we go down. The important thing to realize is that we would have um, one idea for each uh, for each line. We we just put one idea uh, on each line with uh, with this. So we uh, we have what you might call uh, you may have seen this on online where we have um, we would have. Um, nested comments or notes so then we see we can see clearly from the indentation um, the relationships between the ideas so we see the relationships between ideas and see uh, and importantly as well we see the details in context um, the, the whole idea was really to help our understanding, to be an aid for our understanding. So we don't write left to right, we don't write a transcript of everything that the professor will say. Uh, what we do is we um, separate out the major and the minor ideas, and we uh, graphically organize them in such a way that it's very, very clear to see the relationships between the ideas, and it's very, very easy to see the details in context and all of this helps enormously when you come back uh, to uh, do your notes. Just a couple of points here with uh, the vocabulary. Um, in its totality, um, just be aware that we have two different it's in English. Um, some of the contractions, so we have it is, which is it's. So whenever we have this um, apostrophe here, this all often means that there's something missing that there's a word that's been missing and two words have been put together. Uh, we see this pretty, uh, pretty commonly. Should not, shouldn't. We will use the, uh, the apostrophe to actually um, show that there are some missing words. You could even, uh, you, you may even see um, abbreviations uh, done like this. Uh, uh, International arrivals. You'll see this commonly in airports. I N T apostrophe L, meaning international. Uh, 
Um, so you would um, you would see this apostrophe to um, signify and show that there's been um, something removed. Usually one or two letters have been removed. And um, we call these here, we call these um, contractions, um, where um, two words are contracted together. So should not will become shouldn't, and it is will become it's. So just be aware that there is a written um, a written convention here with the apostrophe. Uh, we need to make the difference uh, between it's, um, something belonging to it, the possessive. It does not have uh, an apostrophe, but it is does. Here, multiculturalism, we have the prefix multi, which means many. We have the word root, culture. We have al, which is uh, the suffix for changing a noun into uh, an adjective. So something can be culture. We talk about culture and we talk about something being cultural. And then we have um, this uh, ISM on the end. Um, this ISM, you're probably quite familiar with this uh, because we use ISM um, to describe uh, concepts, ideas, uh, or ideologies. Or ideologies. Okay, so concepts, ideas, or ideologies. So you probably have, um, probably everybody, um, you've probably seen these things: um, socialism, uh, communism, um, two two pretty common isms that we've got here. Um, we also have uh, Margaret Thatcher, Thatcherism, Ronald Reagan. We have Reaganism. These describe the uh, the policies of the prime minister at the time. Uh, interestingly, we will have uh, also Maoism, and we also have uh, Dengism as well. So uh, commonly, we'll see um, the the names of ideologies where there is actually um, there is actually a proper name. So the Mao Zedong thought. Um, I don't think there is a Xi Jinpingism. Uh, we don't really uh, refer to that. Interestingly enough, I think it's just because there is a there's the sound of uh, uh, Shiism. There's the, you can't really um, link that with an ism too much, so we tend to use the uh, we tend to use the proper title for that. But um, we will talk about uh, uh, policies in the Mao era of China, um, Maoism, the idea that uh, obviously I, I'm not really fully familiar, but um, giving peasants the uh, peasants and farmers. Um, uh, means of uh, over means of production and ownership over the landlords and then we have um, uh, dengism from the uh, from the uh, 1980s China's opening up we have uh, Deng Xiaoping we have um, that political uh, that political ideology there but we have socialism communism Thatcherism Reaganism Maoism Dengism all of these different things are um, cultural uh, sorry political ideologies in art, you may actually hear about um, cubism and realism. So it's not just uh, to do with politics. Um, we'll have the cubist movement, and we'll have realism uh, impressionism as well, which was um, an, a, a, an art movement, a way of uh, a painting where you just you don't really look for the details, but you give people the in uh, you give people the impression uh, of the feeling of the of, you know especially being outdoors. So, ism is the concept and the ideologist ideologies or ideas, and the people who um, the people who are committed to these um, to these ideas are often uh, the the prefix is oh sorry the suffix is ist. So you will have a communist, or you will have someone is a oops, someone is a socialist, someone is an impressionist. So we'll add that to, the, to be the um, the person. Um, you'll even find a biologist. You will even find them in um, in uh, the sciences as well. We'll have this IST talking about the person 
who uh, is, is committed to a certain ideology or way of doing things. So ism just means the idea and then the ist is someone who is either um, committed to that idea or carries out that idea. And we'll see these isms a lot. Going through some of these names here, we have, um, obviously we have first name, first name, first name, first name, and then always second. There are no, there are no uh, exceptions to this rule. The, the family name is always second. People can be referred to um, as their, uh, as the, just by the um, surname. It's not really necessary in English, uh, to add a mister if it's obvious who we are talking about. Um, it, it sounds a little bit strange though. I would always say we would always, um, we would always try to um, use the title. So uh, so I would um, use Mr. Obama, Mr. Johnson, uh, Mrs. Thatcher. Obviously um, this, the same convention would apply um, so we often uh, we often read um, uh, newspaper reports um, referring to Xi Jinping um, honorifically. We would um, we would just call him Mr. Xi, even though obviously his in China family names go first. So it's still it's still that Mr. And Mrs. as uh, uh, as uh, with the family name that goes together. Um, it's more common to use the whole name. For public figures, though, so you would actually need to say Barack Obama, you would actually need to say Boris Johnson, or Emmanuel. You wouldn't say Mr. Macron; you would call him Emmanuel Macron. Um, so it's uh, more common for public figures um, to use the uh, to use the full name. I'm just trying to guess, trying to think of some famous people just to add a, add a bit of variety here. So it's um, when you're writing uh, or when you're speaking, when we have public figures like Barack Obama, Boris Johnson, Emmanuel Macron, Nelson Mandela, uh, Tom Cruise, I guess as well. So we would always use the full name. We would use the whole name for public figures um, rather than just referring to them as their surname. Some newspapers, uh, some you may find uh, Mister, but they will always refer to the whole name as once. So they will, the first time they will call him Nelson Mandela, and then in further reference to him, they will just say Mister Mandela because it's clear who they're talking to. But um, for all uh, English names, even if they're Chinese or Japanese, where the family name comes first. It is always Mr., Miss, Mrs., Ms., and then the family name, regardless of where it comes in the, in the, actual, uh, in the actual native language. The Stone Age, um, age and era. Age and era are synonymous. They mean the same thing. The only difference being is that uh, in everyday conversational English, we will refer more to something being an age rather than an era. So uh, we have this idea, uh, obviously, uh, in China, everybody knows the modern era by now, which is the, uh, uh, the uh, kind of uh, Xi Jinping's uh, kind of uh, policy, I guess. So we have um, that era. Era is more of a scientific word. So it's obviously um, given to titles of uh, serious uh, political or scientific, scientific, political or scientific pieces of work. We would normally see era rather than age. So the modern age or the modern era, um, the modern era sounds more um, sounds more academic and more scientific. The three ages that we're always taught at school, uh, every school child knows. Is it the Bronze? No, it's the Iron Age, isn't it? We have the Stone Age, we have the uh, Iron Age, we have the Bronze Age. These are all uh, periods of, sorry, I'll put key periods of 
prehistory. So we have uh, Stone Age, Iron Age, and Bronze Age. Um, pretty much everybody knows these things. Um, before uh, written records were kept, we had we had these different ages. We also had um, these are what we call literal uh, literal names in the. Um, in the Stone Age, people used stones. In the Iron Age, people used iron. These are literally the names. We can also have figurative uh, names for, for periods of history. So in English, we have um, a period of history called the Dark Ages. Um, it wasn't particularly dark, literally dark, but it was figuratively dark in that uh, we don't have a lot of written records from this particular uh, period of time. So uh, in contrast to other periods of time where we have lots of written records and lots of written details, the Dark Ages is um, a period when written records were not widely kept, so we don't have a lot of historical information about that. And this is a figurative name for uh, this particular period of history. It has no reflection whatsoever uh, what was going on at the time. It was, um, it's just a name uh, to reflect the lack of information that we have. Uh, last two down here, uh, Roman conquests and Moorish invasions. The, uh, the Moorish invasions, we don't really have uh, too much of an impact, obviously, because a quick sketch of England, and then we have um, the Channel, and then we have um, France over here. So we have um, island nations um, have a natural barrier to invasion. Um, so the, the Moorish invasions didn't really um, feature very strongly in uh, either the language or the history of the United Kingdom. Um, you may see some references to them in Shakespeare plays, um, but um, really uh, the Moorish invasions were more concerned with Italy and Spain. Um, those two countries are possibly closest connected with um, uh, Middle Eastern countries, especially um, uh, what we would consider um, uh, Muslim countries. Um, Morocco, for example, is quite close to Spain. Spain is um, kind of has an interesting, if anybody uh, goes there, the, uh, the culture of Spain is heavily influenced by um, Arabia. So it's, it's a very interesting place to go where you have um, uh, Islamic uh, architecture. Uh, mixed with um, Western Christian uh, European architecture as well. So, and um, actually in Italy, in the Italian language, there are quite a lot of commonly used um, uh, Arabic words. So the the Moorish invasions were kind of um, fairly um, fairly uh, common, uh, more closely associated with uh, European countries. Uh, actually on the continent than they were with uh, the UK. So we don't see much of an influence uh, of these. But the Roman conquests, um, um, everybody is still, we still have um, lots of uh, Roman relics that we keep finding. So you can't really underestimate the, uh, the impact of, of the, Roman, uh, the Roman Empire. All right, ladies and gentlemen, so we'll take a few minutes. Just see if you can guess which words go into the missing uh, spaces in uh, this. Uh, I think we have 10 sentences here. So just take a moment, see if you can uh, take a guess uh, what words might go into uh, which uh, missing space.
All right then, uh, ladies and gentlemen. So once again, there's quite a, a bit to explain. So um, obviously we need to get used to this idea. I've said this before, where we are learning vocabulary, not from vocabulary lists, but from the context. Um, so um, we need to get really into that habit. So we'll play this a couple of times and then we'll go through uh, any of the more um, unusual features. Whoops, I know, I know, I know. Please don't say anything. I'm going to share the audio. I know, I know, I forgot to do it. Okay, we'll try again. One, culture is that complex whole, which includes knowledge, belief, art, law, morals, custom, and any other capabilities and habits acquired by man as a member of society. 2. Another definition of culture that many find useful is the totality of learned, socially transmitted behavior. 3. Ned Seeley, in his 1993 book, Teaching Culture, lists six skills to nurture and support intercultural communication. Four, cultivate curiosity about another culture and empathy toward its members. Five, recognize that different roles and other social variables such as age, sex, social class, religion, ethnicity, and place of residence affect the way people speak and behave. Okay, and one more time. One. Culture is that complex whole, which includes knowledge, belief, art, law, morals, custom, and any other capabilities and habits acquired by man as a member of society. Two. Another definition of culture that many find useful is the totality of learned, socially transmitted behavior. 3. Ned Seeley, in his 1993 book, Teaching Culture, lists six skills to nurture and support intercultural communication. 4. Cultivate curiosity about another culture and empathy toward its members. 5. Recognize that different roles and other social variables such as age, sex, social class, religion, ethnicity, and place of residence affect the way people speak and behave. Okay, so that complex whole, uh, here we have whole being used as a noun rather than an adjective. So uh, you, you could say something like, I ate the whole thing. Um, whole would be the adjective, thing would be the noun. That complex whole, complex is the adjective and whole is the noun. So uh, you, will, you will find this, um, that um, lots, of, uh, lots of words will be doing what we call double duty. Uh, they'll be functioning, able to function as um, both nouns and adjectives, or even uh, nouns and verbs, in uh, especially in higher level, uh, higher level um, uh, English. We'll, we'll see that. Acquired. Now I have to talk about this uh, verb a lot, and it's very, very important to understand that uh, English. Whoops, English verbs often contain, uh, shall we say, hints as to how the verb is performed. So uh, it's very important to understand that English verbs often give the feeling of how the verb is actually uh, 
performed. So this means that we don't use adjectives. I have said this before. We don't use adjectives, in, uh, sorry, adverbs, in the same way as you do in Chinese. There is very, very little need often to use a verb and adjective when a verb, uh, uh, a different verb, may well give an idea as to how the verb is performed. So for example, you don't say that running is walking quickly because there's a completely different uh, image. If you say that someone is running, it's completely different to someone is, who is walking. And you can't really say that someone is um, walking quickly when you mean running. When we say uh, acquired here, this means that someone is learning by themselves or someone is collecting something and it's taking a long time to complete the collection of a certain something. So uh, collecting habits, habits, collecting capabilities, collecting skills. When we use the word acquired, this actually gives us the impression that it's a slow process that happens over many years. In the same way that develop gives the impression that something happens slowly over a long period of time. Which my point is, ladies and gentlemen, that uh, when we say rapidly develop or rapidly development or rapid development, this actually sounds very strange to uh, native uh, English speakers' ears because develop, if we talk about a photograph being developed, it doesn't happen instantly. It's a long process to develop a photo. If you are developing skills, it takes a long process to do that. If a child is developing from a child to an adult, it takes a relatively long time, five or six years at least, to go from being a child to being an adult. So when you speak of rapid development, it's, uh, it kind of sounds a little bit strange. And uh, the, the word for this really is oxymoron. An oxymoron is uh, when you put two opposing ideas together uh, in a phrase. So, uh, for example, we will have um, in, in Shakespeare is, is full of these things, sweet sorrow. Uh, we have the word sweet and we have the word sorrow. Uh, Parting is such sweet sorrow. We say that this is an oxymoron because um, sorrow can very, very rarely be sweet. Um, and the, the, the two words are pretty much the opposite of each other. So rapid development is uh, an oxymoron and sounds strange. As does uh, common, common phenomena sounds very strange because phenomena has the idea of something extraordinary that happens which has no clear explanation or obvious explanation so you can't have something that's extraordinary like a phenomena and you can't make it common because by its nature it is extraordinary it's used to only describe extraordinary things so again we have another oxymoron common phenomena so you should try to um, think about the way that you're using language um, do the words that you're putting together actually oppose each other, like rapid development. Um, it's not really possible. Um, it's not really um, logical to uh, native speakers' ears that something develops rapidly. Um, it's not really uh, logical to a native English speaker's ears that something is a common phenomenon. We can have uh, strange phenomena, uh, but we really, uh, we really don't have um, common phenomena. So the verb itself oftentimes will have um, clues uh, and give the feeling, it will create a mood as to how something is performed. So to acquire skills or to acquire a language, we would imagine this takes quite a long time. Transmitted, we have this prefix trans and we have the Italian verb or the Latin verb mitere, which uh, means literally to send over. So mit mitere means to send, to, uh, to send, and trans means over. So we put trans and mit together, 
and we get to send over behavior. We will see this prefix being used a lot, trans. Uh, if you take a transatlantic flight, then you fly over the Atlantic Ocean. So you would go from London to New York, and it would be called a transatlantic flight. Nurture and support intercultural communication. Again, we've got the AL, which uh, changes the noun to an adjective. Culture becomes cultural. Um, remember, uh, please be aware of the pronunciation, cultural instead of cultural. Um, there's very, very little uh, connection between the written language and the spoken language uh, in terms of pronunciation in English. So we don't say cultural, we say cultural. Uh, intercultural, uh, inter means between. So intercultural communication is communication between cultures. You can see this, trans this prefix a lot in uh, English all the time. So we have international, uh, the word root is nation. And international just means between two, between countries. That's it. It, it doesn't really need, it needs a minimum of two, obviously. But uh, intercultural is between cultures. International is between countries. Cultivate curiosity about another culture. Here we have an example of how we use uh, metaphors in everyday English. So we've seen a lot of these. Um, we've seen a lot of these. Um, we've seen... Um, UNESCO and the United Nations, we would say that UNESCO is an arm of the United Nations. We've seen that there are fields of research or fields of study. It's not a literal field. It's uh, a field of research, a field of study. And uh, a field of study can have branches. So we can have physics, a branch of physics would be astrophysics. So especially when we're showing the relationship between two things, we would use metaphors. It's much easier to use a metaphor to show the relationship between two things. Or when we're dealing with abstract nouns like curiosity, we would use a metaphor. So rather than describe an abstract noun, or what, rather than describe the relationship between two things, and there are lots of common everyday metaphors that we would use in order to get the message across uh, more concisely and more accurately. Empathy is a Greek word. There's not a lot of English. <laughs> not a lot of English in English. So uh, we have um, pathy is the suffix. And this is from the Greek, uh, which means pathos. And M means in. So we have, if you are in pathos with someone, this just means that you can identify with someone else. Especially when we talk about empathy, we especially talk about identifying with the suffering or, um, or um, so if someone's ill, you know, you feel sorry for them because you know how they feel. If someone has a bad cold or someone has uh, uh, food poisoning or something like that um, everybody knows what is how horrible it is to be sick so if you can identify with someone else's suffering and we can do this with animals as well this is one of the uh, uniquely human things uh, no other animal uh, has empathy um, because basically if, if animals had empathy they would never kill and eat another animal so we have uh, empathy we also have sympathy where we sympathize, we understand, uh, we understand uh, how another person feels. Uh, that actually comes from the French, actually. Um, sans pas means nice or agreeable. Uh, and then they add the pathies to be, um, to, um, to agree with someone is to have sympathy with someone. Uh, to identify with someone, someone else's suffering, we say you have empathy. Not just someone else's, but uh, you know, if you see a sick animal, you will feel sorry for that animal. Social variables, we have A-B-L-E, which is a French word. Uh, variable, which is, uh, just basically means likely to change a lot. And then we have, um, we've seen this prefix before, um, ethno, meaning uh, of society, another Greek uh, prefix. 
we have uh, ethnicity, ethnocentric, ethnic. We have all of these uh, relationships with human societies and uh, different, um, different ethnic groups, uh, different cultures as well. Okay, so here are sentences uh, 6 to 10. 6. Realize that effective communication requires discovering the culturally conditioned images of people when they think, act, and react to the world around them. 7. Recognize that situational variables and conventions shape people's behavior in important ways. 8. Understand that people generally act the way they do because they are exercising the options their society allows for satisfying basic physical and psychological needs. 9. Culture and society must coexist. 10. In the long history of human life, multiculturalism is a fairly recent phenomenon. Okay, and one more time. Oh, come on. 6. Realize that effective communication requires discovering the culturally conditioned images of people when they think, act, and react to the world around them. 7. Recognize that situational variables and conventions shape people's behavior in important ways. 8. Understand that people generally act the way they do because they are exercising the options their society allows for satisfying basic physical and psychological needs. 9. Culture and society must coexist. 10. In the long history of human life, multiculturalism is a fairly recent phenomenon. Okay, so let's go through some of these. I'm going to leave uh, 6, 7, 8. I need to come back because there's some... Uh, this uh, something I do need to tell you about that. Um, culturally conditioned. Um, here, the word conditioned means the same as trained. So culturally trained or culturally conditioned images. When we have, uh, we have a lot of this in English where oftentimes we will see the first sound uh, will be used and it, and it gives a nice rhythm. We have this idea of euphony again. <clears throat> we have this idea of uh, euphony, which is the pleasant sound of the language. So we don't say culturally, we, we could say culturally trained, but it's, um, it's a little bit nicer and it sounds a little bit more, um, more pleasant to the ear uh, to say culturally conditioned because we have cur and cur. We have two words that begin with um, the same letter. And in English, um, this is known as alliteration, um, where we have, uh, we will often put together to make something more impactful and to make something a little bit more memorable. Um, we will often um, put uh, combinations of words that begin with the same letter, just because of the the euphony, the uh, pleasant sounding uh, nature of those words going together. So culturally trained, you could say that, but it's actually um, much more pleasant to the uh, to hear culturally conditioned because of the k and the k. Culturally conditioned, we have the k and the k sound. And in English, this is called alliteration. 
and it's a common device used in um, in literature and um, in the public speaking as well uh, when you want to uh, make your uh, make your spoken language sound just a little bit more uh, a little bit more attractive a little bit more um, pleasant so we could say culturally trained but we generally say because of the alliteration we would say culturally conditioned situational variables again we have situation as the word root here and then we have al because we have variables as the noun we need to change situation to an adjective and we can do that just adding al conventions uh, another french word uh, situation convention uh, t-i-o-n uh, at the end means a french word a couple of collocations here Collocations, these are verb, verb and noun set phrases that always go together. I mean by this, when we have um, something like uh, make the bed, uh, we don't say do the bed, we say make the bed. So we often have verb and noun set phrases. And these set phrases are called collocations. So here we would exercise our options, or we would uh, more commonly you would hear exercise your rights. Um, so exercising can have uh, the idea of physical exercising, and it can also have the idea that you're um, you're um, uh, exercising an option or you're exercising a right is uh, what we say. You satisfy a physical need, you satisfy a psychological need, you satisfy your thirst, and you satisfy your hunger. So satisfy hunger, satisfy thirst, satisfy needs. We always talk about this. So co-locations, um, exercise options, exercise rights, satisfy needs here. Culture and society must coexist. Here we have the word root is exist, and the prefix is co, which means together. So we have operate, and we can have uh, cooperate to work together. Again, we have uh, lots of prefixes and suffixes uh, slammed together in one word multiculturalism. Here I've got that ism, meaning the idea of, and then phenomenon. And I just have to say this again, that phenomenon in everyday English has the idea of something extraordinary that doesn't seem to have an obvious explanation. So just be careful about how you're using phenomenon in your everyday, in your, uh, everyday and written language. Now just a brief word on sentences six, seven, and eight. These three sentences, are a little bit different to regular sentences. In the lecture, they are rules or guidelines uh, for being more understanding to other cultures. And we call this the imperative mood. Moods will give a sense or a feeling. They are not tenses. Tenses describe time. So if you want to tell someone when um, a verb was performed, we always use a tense. So we use uh, past tense, we use uh, ing. Um, the tenses describe time. They don't describe senses or feelings in, uh, in a sentence. We don't, uh, we don't get the feeling or the sense from a tense, we get the feeling or the sense from a mood. And moods can be quite difficult to understand. Uh, we don't really have a lot of them uh, in English. Uh, thankfully, we don't have the subjunctive mood, which is very, very common in um, Italian, French, and Spanish. But we do have an imperative. Normally, we use the we use the indicative, which is basically telling, 
telling what something is. When we indicate to someone, we tell people what something is. And this, um, the indicative mood um, also covers the subjunctive in, uh, in English. So we can tell a personal opinion and we can also tell a fact in the indicative mood. And it's, um, it is virtually, virtually the same. So this test is difficult. That is my opinion. But because I use the word is, it's, uh, you could say this test is 45 minutes long. That's a fact. But then you can also say this test is difficult. Uh, that's, um, that's an opinion, which is um, expressed in the same way as a fact. So the, uh, the distinction is, is, kind of, um, is kind of not very clear in English. In the imperative, simply put, we are giving orders in the imperative mood. Um, we are enforcing, we are enforcing rules. So the imperative mood is something to be avoided as much as possible um, because giving orders or enforcing rules can sound very confrontational and can sound uh, very aggressive. It's really something that only um, uh, the police and the army uh, would do. Uh, you would very, very rarely um, give orders, use the imperative mood in the sense of giving orders or enforcing rules. So uh, you can see here that realize that, recognize that, understand that. There is no pronoun here. It's uh, not used in the imperative. So you may want to soften your language a little bit to make something seem less aggressive. And you could say, you might realize that, or you could recognize that, or you must understand that. This would soften the language a little bit and make it sound less aggressive. And in English, uh, just as uh, people do in German, it's very, very important. People go to great lengths in uh, German and English. Um, about 50% of all, it, sound, it feels often like 50% uh, of all German and all English is uh, apologizing for asking someone to do something. Um, we very, very rarely use the imperative mood. You may occasionally find it, um, especially uh, when uh, in terms of um, giving safety, giving safety advice. So for example, uh, Wear a seatbelt. This is the imperative. Or, um, or stop smoking. Or no smoking here. So when we remove the pronoun from a lot of these, uh, a lot of these um, signs, warning signs that give uh, safety advice a lot, um, we will uh, we will find just the verb just a verb and maybe a possessive, but we will never find a pronoun. So you would never say, if you want to ask politely, could you fasten your seatbelt? Please make sure that you wear a seatbelt. So there's a pronoun there. If we just say wear a seatbelt or fasten your seatbelt, this sounds aggressive, but it's important because it's safety advice. You may also find this used playfully You will find it um, used playfully in advertising. Um, drink Coke. Oops. Or uh, visit, visit Disneyland today. So you will find the imperative being used playfully in advertising or, or most commonly uh, when you're giving safety advice or receiving safety advice. But please try to avoid um, directly translating into the imperative. It does sound very, very strange. Um, as an alternative, uh, you can actually use um, the modal verb must. So culture and society must coexist. This is a little bit softer because although we say, we make the statement it must coexist, we don't know for sure that they will 
coexist in the future. So when we use the modal verb, we make a statement, but we don't know for sure that they will coexist in the future. So they must coexist, but we don't know for sure that that is exactly what will happen in the future. So um, an alternative to using the imperative is to use um, modal verbs like must or have to. Um, have to is for personal obligation. So I have to pick up my children from school is something that I personally must do. Um, if you must show your passport, that is something that everybody has to do. The other thing that I must point out here is the use of you'd better. Uh, you'd better needs to have It needs to have a negative consequence. You can't just say, you'd better go downstairs. You have to say, you'd better go downstairs, or you won't be able to collect your parcel, or something like that. So when you use you'd better, you always need to add a negative consequence to uh, the you'd better. So you'd better, you'd better take notes You'd better take notes or you'll forget things that will be on the exam. So there always needs to be a negative consequence with you'd better. You'd better is not the same as must or have to. But both of these, all of these, are preferable to using the imperative mood. The imperative mood is very confrontational and it's very aggressive and it sounds... Um, you will not be able to uh, make things less aggressive if you start off with the imperative. So just be uh, careful about using the imperative mood there. Okay, so on to uh, some language points here. Uh, what we have here is we have um, signposting language or the yeah, discourse, discourse cues. We will see them. We will have discourse, oops, discourse markers, uh, or signposting language. There's many different uh, names. They go uh, go by many many different names here, and they can be quite wide ranging. We'll um, we'll look at this uh, just basically in the context of explaining an idea because that's basically what um, it's basically what a lecture is, is explaining ideas so we use these discourse cues these discourse markers this signposting language in explaining an idea specifically in a lecture and you already know these you're already quite familiar with them um, firstly secondly thirdly after that last but not least the only difference that I need to point out for you is that these uh, discourse markers, this, this signposting language, is never used to introduce an idea. We never use it to introduce a main idea. We can use it to describe a main idea, but we never ever use it um, in written, uh, formal written or spoken English. We never use it to introduce an idea. We can explain the idea, but we never introduce the idea. In order to introduce the idea, we need to use um, what we call uh, transitions. So in order to show cohesion of ideas from one idea to the other, we always have to use transitions. We never use signposting language. Firstly, secondly, thirdly, and then the main idea. We always have to say something that now we so now that we've looked at the importance of idea A. Let's look or let's see the significance of idea B. 
So we have two parts to this. The first is, now that we've looked at the importance of idea A, this is a review. Let's see the significance of idea B. This is the preview. So we introduce ideas using longer sentences called transitions. And transitions do exactly that. They transition from one idea to the next. So when you're linking ideas together in an essay, or when you're linking ideas together in a speech, we need to use these transition statements in order to show that our ideas are linked together and they have some sense of cohesion. When you just say firstly, secondly, thirdly, last but not least, in a word, you're not really showing a lot of cohesion. It's very, very easy to get lost and confused when you're listening to someone talk like this. So we'll often hear uh, in lectures, we'll often hear discourse cues or uh, these discourse markers being used to describe or explain an idea. But we will always find that we use transitions to show cohesion of ideas from one idea to the other. And we always review a previous idea and we always preview what's going to come next. We don't need to give a lot of detail in the preview. We just need to tell people that the next main idea is coming up. And this is how we're able to separate main ideas from minor ideas when we're listening. We listen out for the transitions which introduce the main ideas. And then we listen out for discourse cues to hear how the idea is being explained. You'll learn more about this on the, uh, the public speaking course uh, in the second year. But just be aware that these don't introduce new ideas. They are used to describe uh, ideas in the process, and they used to describe and explain the idea itself. Just a brief note on this here. Um, this set of notes here is going from left to right. That's a really bad arrow, sorry. It looks nothing like an arrow. So when we start to the left-hand side of the page, and we go all the way across to the right hand side of the page. And then we go back like this, all the way back across. If we come back and look at these notes a few hours later, it's going to be really, really difficult to see how these, um, how these ideas are related to each other. Because it's just one long sentence of, uh, of abbreviations and acronyms. It's very difficult to see how things are related, it's difficult to, um, to see uh, which are the major ideas and which are the minor ideas. So it's usually a bad idea, it's not really recommended when you're making notes to go from left to right and just write as you would um, write an essay or as you would uh, write normally on the page. It's not really something that you would do because uh, we need to graphically organize. We need to uh, graphically organize Oh, let's see if I can graphically organize our notes so that they're much easier to understand when we come back. So we'll see this on the next page. So just to show you here, what I would do here, so we have one idea, we go down the page, one idea for each line. So each line is just one idea. And we use numbers to signify the main ideas. And then we can use Roman numerals or we can use letters to actually um, show the relationship um, of the minor ideas with the major ideas. What we'll find here, as I said, we can uh, nest And so we can nest the ideas and notes inside one another. So we can show relationships. And when we can see the relationships between ideas, when we can see the small ideas and how those small ideas fit in with the big idea, we can have a deeper understanding. And that's really what we're aiming for at university level. We're looking with people having a deep understanding 
and being able to think deeply um, about a topic. And that only comes from organizing your ideas uh, clearly uh, to show the relationships inside one another um, so that we can actually see very, very quickly how one thing is related to another thing. So graphically organizing in terms of lists and using indentation is uh, very, very useful, uh, when you, especially when you come back to reviewing your notes. The last thing you want the day before the exam is um, a lot of notes that you can't understand. And you can't see the relationships between those ideas. Okay, so we'll take a look at uh, this lecture here. The first thing we're going to do is, as we did in the last class, you just need to listen to the lecture. I'll play the whole thing. And then uh, try and put these slides into the order that you think uh, best represents, best reflects the content of the lecture. You may see already that we've got, um, we go from the general to the more specific, and really uh, the detail is, uh, is the, uh, in, the, in the last few slides, the last three slides especially, things get quite detailed. And this really shows you and demonstrates how uh, lectures and speeches and essays uh, are structured. So we don't start with the most complex detailed thing. Uh, we often start with the most general and broadest thing. And then gradually uh, we become more and more focused on ideas that we've already introduced previously. So we will very, very rarely be introducing new ideas towards the end of the lecture. And we'll just be um, showing you old ideas in a different context, hopefully, so you'll be able to understand them better. So here's the first lecture. Uh, don't worry about the questions. Uh, just put the, put the slides in order, one to five. Let me begin the lecture today by asking, what exactly is culture? This question has been approached by anthropologists in many different ways. Murdoch, for example, in Outline of World Cultures, produced what many have called the ultimate laundry list of things cultural by naming 900-odd categories of human behavior. I won't attempt to go into these at this time. Another less lengthy list is the famous grocery list of Edward B. Tyler. He wrote, Culture is that complex whole which includes knowledge, belief, art, law, morals, custom, and any other capabilities and habits acquired by man as a member of society. But another definition of culture that many find useful is Kessing's The Totality of Learned Socially Transmitted Behavior. Obviously, this definition leaves out much if we feel obligated to include all the ways of life that have been evolved by people in every society. A particular culture, then, would mean the total shared way of life of a given group. This would include their ways of thinking, acting, and feeling, as reflected in their religion, law, language, art, and customs, as well as concrete things such as houses, clothing, and tools. Cultural anthropology is the study of cultures, living and dead. In its totality, it includes linguistics, the study of speech forms, archaeology, the study of dead cultures, and ethnology, which is the study of living cultures, or those that can be observed directly. So, why study cultural anthropology? One reason noted by Ruth Benedict, another well-known anthropologist, is that the story of humanity from the Stone Age to the present is such a fascinating one of cultural growth. Interestingly, according to Tyler's and Morgan's cultural development theories, Every society has gone through three stages or steps. These are savagery, barbarism, and finally, civilization. The last is, of course, to varying degrees. 
We are often reminded of another compelling reason to learn about different cultures, to learn and use a foreign language effectively. Most of us realize that just knowing the language of another culture is not enough for meaningful communication. You can ask anyone who has tried to use their high school Spanish inside a Spanish-speaking country. Ned Seeley, in his 1993 book, Teaching Culture, lists six skills to nurture and support intercultural communication. Number one, cultivate curiosity about another culture and empathy toward its members. Number two, Recognize that different roles and other social variables such as age, sex, social class, religion, ethnicity, and place of residence affect the way people speak and behave. Number three, realize that effective communication requires discovering the culturally conditioned images of people when they think, act, and react to the world around them. Number four, recognize that situational variables and conventions shape people's behavior in important ways. Number five, understand that people generally act the way they do because they are exercising the options their society allows for satisfying basic physical and psychological needs. And finally, number six, Develop the ability to evaluate the truth of a generalization about the target culture and to locate and organize information about the target culture from books, mass media, people, and personal observations. Culture and society must coexist. Without living together, people cannot create a culture or a way of life. If a group or society is small, isolated, and stable, it might also share a single culture. In fact, there are still what are called uncontacted peoples, groups of people who live in very remote areas of the rainforest in Peru and Brazil, who probably share a single culture. And now, instead of making contact in order to study them, Cultural anthropologists and governments of these countries are making efforts to protect their regions from intrusions. It is important to remember, however, that large societies, such as those in Canada, the United States, India, or Egypt, are multicultural or pluralist societies. They also tend to have many subcultures, in the long history of human life, multiculturalism is a fairly recent phenomenon. Those of us in multicultural environments must remember that discovering similarities among people from different cultures is as important as identifying differences. For example, in classrooms on just about every university campus in the world, we find students from many different social and ethnic backgrounds. What are some of the universals that you and other international students have all experienced in your earlier educational life? One common universal is that all cultures use rewards and punishments to encourage correct behavior. Another example is that Societies withhold certain information from the young. This might include faults in our leaders or sexual taboos. A third universal is the effort by the controlling group in a culture to educate the young to strengthen and secure its dominant position. In the majority of contemporary societies, this control is reached through political means in contrast to the military actions of earlier times, such as the Roman conquests and the Moorish invasions. In closing this lecture on societies and culture, let me remind you not to forget the contributions of thoughts and actions of the individual person in a group. Note the observation of Edward Sapir, another famous anthropologist. 
It is always the individual that really thinks and acts and dreams and revolts. Obviously, the concept of culture will be argued by anthropologists for years to come. Okay, so let's see if I can show you these slides without this uh, PPT will uh, behave itself. So we should have slide number one, what is culture? Slide number two, what are some concrete things? about uh, popular culture uh, for a particular culture then shared way of life thinking etc uh, three cultural anthropology four coexistence of culture and society and slide number five how many universals among cultures does the lecture mention similarities across cultures okay so hopefully the next slide will be okay we're all in order now so one two three four and five so we'll move on to uh, the individual questions now so how many categories did murdoch list that's something we need to listen out for let me begin the lecture today by asking what exactly is culture this question has been approached by anthropologists in many different ways. Murdoch, for example, in Outline of World Cultures, produced what many have called the ultimate laundry list of things cultural by naming 900-odd categories of human behavior. I won't attempt to go into these at this time. Another less lengthy list is the famous grocery list of Edward B. Tyler. He wrote, Culture is that complex whole which includes knowledge, belief, art, law, morals, custom, and any other capabilities and habits acquired by man as a member of society. But another definition of culture that many find useful is Kessing's the totality of learned, socially transmitted behavior. Obviously, this definition leaves out much if we feel obligated to include all the ways of life that have been evolved by people in every society. So, how many categories did Murdoch list? And the answer is, um, this is a, a very colloquial term here, um, 900 odd categories and in both British English and uh, American English 900 odd means about 900 or roughly 900 just make sure when you're saying this that you link odd with the number so you would say you wouldn't say 900 odd categories because this would sound like 900 strange categories you would have to say odd dread odd hundred odd nine hundred odd so this uh, links back to the idea of thought groups that we were talking about you group um, you group sounds together sounds and words together into a thought into a group uh, uh, that expresses a single thought so you have to say it as nine hundred odd you can't just say it as nine hundred odd it sounds very strange when you put um, even the slightest pause to a native English speaker's ear, it sounds um, a little bit odd. Um, I think that this one is quite short, so what are some concrete things that tell us about a particular culture? A particular culture, then, would mean the total shared way of life of a given group. This would include their ways of thinking, acting, and feeling as reflected in their religion, law, language, art, and customs, as well as concrete things such as houses, clothing, and tools. So uh, very simply, what are some concrete things here? Um, housing, clothing, and tools are the concrete things. Um, when we talk about concrete things, we don't, again, this is another metaphor here. We don't literally talk about something made of concrete. Um, we talk about something um, as opposed to abstract. We talk about concrete things being something that we can touch. 
Um, it's not literally made of concrete. We, it's just a metaphorical concrete thing in that it actually exists and we can touch it. So listen out for this one. This is quite a long uh, section here. What is the definition of cultural anthropology? Cultural anthropology is the study of cultures, living and dead. In its totality, it includes linguistics, the study of speech forms, archaeology, the study of dead cultures, and ethnology, which is the study of living cultures, or those that can be observed directly. So, why study cultural anthropology? One reason noted by Ruth Benedict, another well-known anthropologist, is that the story of humanity from the Stone Age to the present is such a fascinating one of cultural growth. Interestingly, according to Tyler's and Morgan's cultural development theories, every society has gone through three stages or steps. These are savagery, barbarism, and finally, civilization. The last is, of course, to varying degrees. We are often reminded of another compelling reason to learn about different cultures, to learn and use a foreign language effectively. Most of us realize that just knowing the language of another culture is not enough for meaningful communication. You can ask anyone who has tried to use their high school Spanish inside a Spanish-speaking country. Ned Seeley, in his 1993 book, Teaching Culture, lists six skills to nurture and support intercultural communication. Number one, cultivate curiosity about another culture and empathy toward its members. Number two, recognize that different roles and other social variables such as age, sex, social class, religion, ethnicity, and place of residence affect the way people speak and behave. Number three, realize that effective communication requires discovering the culturally conditioned images of people when they think, act, and react to the world around them. Number four, recognize that situational variables and conventions shape people's behavior in important ways. Number five, understand that people generally act the way they do because they are exercising the options their society allows for satisfying basic physical and psychological needs. And finally, number six, develop the ability to evaluate the truth of a generalization about the target culture and to locate and organize information about the target culture from books, mass media, people, and personal observations. So, uh, what's the definition of cultural anthropology? You didn't need to listen too long to this. Cultural anthropology is the study of cultures, living and dead. So, cultural anthropology is the study of cultures, living and dead. Now, I can't hear this. I think this is a mistake in the book. Um, I've been, I've listened to this a number of times. I will give you the, give you the answer. Pluralist. So the answer that they've got in the textbook um, is Canada. Um, it's also on the slides. I'll just show you. It's on the uh, it's on the slide here. So, oh come on! It's on the slides here. Further on, um, I've listened to this at least. This is uh, this is uh, something that I've listened to now about six times. An example of a pluralist society is Canada. I can't hear the word Canada in this at all. Maybe I'm just blanking, so I'll give you the answer straight away and uh, we can just listen, see if you can hear it. 
culture and society must coexist. Without living together, people cannot create a culture or a way of life. If a group or society is small, isolated, and stable, it might also share a single culture. In fact, there are still what are called uncontacted peoples, groups of people who live in very remote areas of the rainforest in Peru and Brazil, who probably share a single culture. And now, instead of making contact in order to study them, cultural anthropologists and governments of these countries are making efforts to protect their regions from intrusions. It is important to remember, however, that large societies, such as those in Canada, the United States, India, or Egypt, are multicultural or pluralist societies. They also tend to have many subcultures. In the long history of human life, multiculturalism is a fairly recent phenomenon. Those of us in multicultural environments must remember that discovering similarities among people from different cultures is as important as identifying differences. For example, in classrooms on just about every university campus in the world, we find students from many different social and ethnic backgrounds. What are some of the universals that you and other international students have all experienced in your earlier educational life? So I'm not sure whether I'll be able to uh, see if I can see the key on that doesn't show you that. Uh, I'm not really sure. Peru, Brazil. Uh, oh, uh, right. It's important to remember, however, that large societies such as those in Canada, the United States, are multicultural or pluralist societies. So uh, that was uh, where I was missing. I was, must have been blanking a little bit there. So um, I don't know why the text is messed up there. So we've got that. Uh, it's important to remember, however, that large societies, there it is, right at the start. Tricked even me, so don't feel bad if you missed it. How do I get back here? Get back to the listener. And finally, slide five. How many universals among all cultures does the lecturer mention? One common universal is that all cultures use rewards and punishments to encourage correct behavior. Another example is that societies withhold certain information from the young. This might include faults in our leaders or sexual taboos. A third universal is the effort by the controlling group in a culture to educate the young to strengthen and secure its dominant position. In the majority of contemporary societies, this control is reached through political means in contrast to the military actions of earlier times, such as the Roman conquests and the Moorish invasions. In closing this lecture on societies and culture, let me remind you not to forget the contributions of thoughts and actions of the individual person in a group. Note the observation of Edward Sapir, another famous anthropologist. It is always the individual that really thinks and acts and dreams and revolts. Obviously, the concept of culture will be argued by anthropologists for years to come. Okay, so the universals here, they're not really um, uh, directly told to you. I'll just play the, uh, just play the, first, uh, the first section again. One common universal is that all cultures use rewards and punishments to encourage correct behavior. Another example is that societies withhold certain information from the young. This might include faults in our leaders or sexual taboos. A third universal is the effort by the controlling group in a culture to educate the young, to strengthen and secure its dominant position. Okay, 
So uh, maybe in the script here, I can show you. So we have uh, one common universal. So we don't say firstly, secondly, and then thirdly. So this would be one common universal is that all cultures use rewards. Another example is that societies withhold certain information. A third universal is the effort by the controlling group. So we don't really list using numbers directly. So first, number one, universal, number two, universal. Uh, one common universal in terms of um, the first one, and then another being the second one, and then third. So there is, there is some kind of, um, you can see that there's some kind of cohesion here where the, the third and final one is actually um, directly told to you as being the third one. But the first two, we need to listen out for these discourse cues, one common universal, one common, and then a noun is a, is a common way of uh, introducing um, an example. So one common way, one common thing, another example, another thing, another way, that would be number two. And then finally, she makes sure that everybody is uh, clear as to where, where we are uh, in, the, in the speech, in the lecture, by saying that the third universal is the effort. So there are three universals here, but the tricky thing was that they weren't really being explicitly, uh, directly told to you. Let's see if I can get rid of this now. All right, ladies and gentlemen.